In this video, we're going to see how to update a recycler view with model view view model and live data. A couple of notes here. I already have a series of videos where I've talked about what an adapter is, what a view holder is, and what a row layout is. I've created that already. As a matter of fact, I created that in a super class called Diary Fragment. So our focus on this video is really the live data part, not so much creating the recycler view from scratch. If you're interested in that, I'll point you to a few other videos in this playlist. Nonetheless, we're going to do our work in something called Main Fragment, and we're going to inherit many things we did in this super class called Diary Fragment fragment. As our app exists right now, we have the specimen screen where a specimen is a plant that you can plant, something you can touch, take a photograph of, so on and so forth. We're going to add a brand new recycler view right down here. And the recycler view is going to show events that occur on this specimen. So for example, this one I can say water, uh, one gallon. And on this screen, you see that I have an existing recycler view where that appears here. That's just serving from in memory. What I want to do is I want to show those events back on this main screen as well, and I want to show them by using live data. So first thing we need to do is go to that event or that detail screen. We need to make a little change to that. When we save an event, right now we're just putting it in memory. Let's go ahead and save it to Firebase, and let's do that with our view model. So we'll say view model dot save, and then we'll pass in our event. Now, this method does not yet exist, so let's go into view model and let's create it. In the main view model, we already have a save function, but it's for saving a specimen. So we're just going to override that. In other words, we're going to have a function with the same name, but a different parameter list. So fun save, let's make it internal, internal fun save, event of type event. And even though we already have a save function, because that signature is unique, you see right here, uh, this is not a uniquely identifiable function, so we are in good shape. Now, saving it is actually fairly straightforward. We, if we look at our existing save, we already have a way to walk from Firestore root to our collection of specimens to a specific specimen. So I'm going to go ahead and grab that, and I'm going to paste that down here in our save function. If it helps to visualize, we just start at home, we go to specimens, then we can pick an individual specimen, and then that specimen has a collection. In this case, there's one called photos. We're going to make a new one called events. But to get there, we have to walk this path from root to the collection specimens to a specific specimen that we're updating. And this specimen is already populated. We did that in a previous video where we were saving the specimen. So we've walked to that specimen. Now let's walk one more step to a collection and let's simply call this one events. And if it doesn't exist, not to worry, it will be created. Let's store this in a variable, a final variable called collection. Now from here, we simply say collection dot add event. Really, that's it. We do need to add an on success and on failure listener, but uh, really that's, that's all there is to it. So let's say val task equals collection.add event and then task and on this we can say add on success listener we get the open and close curly and we can say event.id equals it.id now what does that mean it is a document reference that's the document that was just saved id is the unique identifier as created by fire firebase cloud firestore similar to what you would see here, a unique identifier, essentially. We do need to add an attribute to, for that to our event data class. We'll handle that in just a moment. First, let's go ahead and add an onFailure listener. So task.add onFailure listener. Once again, open curly, close curly. And in here, we'll say var message equals it.message, because in this case, the iteration variable is an exception. Uh, we should log it. We're just going to set something here so we can look at a breakpoint. If something goes wrong, var i equals 1 plus 1 will give us an ability to step forward and actually look at that message. Okay, we'll save this, and then we'll take a look at our event class because I know I need to add this ID. In the land of Firebase, an ID is a string. So let's go ahead and add it to the end of our constructor call here. We'll save our ID colon string equals, and then we'll just do a default value of open and close quotes. By giving it a default value, this is now an optional parameter in this constructor. So any calls that already exist to this constructor will still work without specifying this parameter. But by adding it here as a parameter to a data class, it essentially becomes an attribute of this data class. So at this point, I'm comfortable that our events are getting stored. And we see it compiles. 
Now for the next part, we want to take this collection of events that are on Firebase Cloud Firestore, and we want to link them up to live data using mutable live data. So let's start by going to the top, declare a new private var events equals mutable live data list event and invoke the constructor on it just like so. Now that's private, so we'll go towards the bottom and we'll do a getter setter Kotlin style. We'll say internal var events mutable live data list event get return underscore events set value underscore events equals value just like so. So we're making this available so that it can be observed in its mutable live data. The next thing we need to do is we need to listen for changes to these events. Now a nice thing about Firebase Cloud Firestore with the collections documents and then collections documents the way that alternates back and forth is we can listen at any one of these levels so we can get very granular if we wish. So still in our view model let's make a function fun fe uh, internal fun fetch events and we'll say var events collection equals firestore dot collection and take a look by the way at line 96 I'm going to be do doing something very similar to the save we did on line 96 so firestore dot collection and we'll say specimens which is our high level collection and then we'll say dot document specimen specimen ID so we're we're zeroing in on a very specific specimen let me separate this out make it a little easier to read and then we'll say dot collection, guess what, events. And hopefully that looks fairly similar to what we have above. Sure enough, it does. So we're listening to changes to a very specific uh, series of events for a specific specimen. Let's say events collection, add snapshot listener. And that says, okay, Firebase, I wanna pay attention to when any of this changes. Let's use the kind of curly syntax we have here. That's a really easy way to do it. And we see that this is a Lambda expression that's passing in two things, a query snapshot and a Firebase Firestore exception. Now the query snapshot is a look at this Firebase collection at a point in time when this has been updated. But it, Firebase doesn't know what an event is. That's, that's kind of something specific to us. So let's see what options we have available here. We say query snapshot, and then we'll say question mark indicating it's nullable, dot two objects. Look at that two objects. And what that has to do is essentially cast this to a specific type. And the type we're going to specify is event colon colon class dot Java, which is just how we specify a type in Kotlin. So now we can save this to, let's make it a local variable of events. We'll save our events equals query snapshot event. You could even call that something like inner event, just because I keep using that name events over and over again. Want to make want to make a distinction here. Now. Uh, remember how we update mutable live data? We do it with something called post value. So let's take that private variable we made called events. Note it's of type mutable live data. If you take a look over here to the right, and we'll simply say post value, and we'll pass in inner events. Most of the remainder of our work is now going to happen in this class called main fragment, and that's the class that's backing up this look and feel that you see here. You might remember that when we select an item from the dropdown, it populates this screen with the data that we selected from the spinner or dropdown, if you wish, whatever you want to call it. So you see Eastern Red Bud in Bloom, you see it's populating this down here. And that occurs right here in this on item selected function that we created in a previous video. So what I want to do is simply trigger an update of the events for this specimen. Because you see, we're kind of doing a lazy load here. We're loading all these specimens when the screen loads, but we're not loading each of the individual events because who knows how many there might be. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to trigger that load anytime we click on an individual specimen. So let's say view model, fetch events. Next, we simply need to implement our recycler view. Remember that our fragment extends from diary fragment, and up in diary fragment, we have a, an events adapter that we created in a previous video, and we have an event view holder that we created in a previous video. So that we're going to borrow. Let's go to our main fragment though, and I'll tell you what, we're no longer, we no longer need this image view that's here. So I'm gonna take that away. I'll likely have a bit of cleanup to do as well as I remove that. 
uh, back in my source code. Not going to worry too much about that just yet. What I am going to do is take this recycler view and drop it right in this canvas. And then I have to go through the little trickiness to get the constraints lined up just right. That one, that one uh, to top to bottom. There we go. That looks good. And we got our left constraint and our right constraint. And finally, the bottom constraint. Let's give it a name, RCY events for specimens. Now back to our main fragment. Let's wire a few things up. We're in the on activity created function, which is starting to get a little bit long. A little bit of boilerplate here, similar to what we did when we implemented a recycler view in our event fragment, the detail fragment we saw earlier. So let's say RCY events for specimen has fixed size. RCY events for specimen dot layout manager equals linear layout manager context. RCY events for specimens. Whoop, looks like we need to do a little import here. Okay. Dot item animator equals default item animator. And finally, RCY events for specimens dot adapter equals events adapter. And remember, that's one of the inner classes that we are inheriting from our superclass. So we need to provide it with a collection and a layout manager. The collection we'll get to in just a second. The layout manager is going to be r.layout.rowLayout. And that, again, is something we created in a previous video. So it's redlining here for a moment. Let's make that collection to take care of the redline. I scroll up towards the top of the main fragment and say private var underscore events equals array list event. Open and close print to indicate that we are constructing an object and then we'll simply import our event. Now we go back down to our red line and now we know what collection we need to put in there, which is underscore events. By the way, I, I have noticed I have a couple red lines here and it's from me removing that image view to replace it with the recycler view. I don't like having red lines, that's technical debt. So just an aside, I'm go going to go ahead and clean that up. Good, so now no red lines and we have our events collection going into this events adapter. So the last thing we need to do is we need to populate that events adapter by using live data. Very similar to the construction that we've seen before when we're observing on live data, we simply need to set up an observable pattern like you see here where we're observing on plants, we're observing on specimens. Let's create one more of those. So we'll say view model, the view model is what owns the live data, dot events dot observe. And then we'll say this and then observer, open curly and close curly, just like so. And again, following that exact same syntax that you see up above. Notice what happens when we observe on events. What are we getting back? We're getting back a list of event objects and it's being held in the iteration variable IT. IT is that default variable name if we have a one parameter lambda and we don't want to specify our own name. Let's go ahead and specify our own name just to make it more clear. So we'll say events and then we use the lambda separator like so, that kind of arrow. And you notice that IT goes away as soon as we do that. So what we can do here is say underscore events which is our private variable, dot add all events. The only trick with that is it's going to keep adding more events every time we select a new uh, specimen. So we need to remove the old ones as well. So let's say underscore events dot remove all underscore events. As funny as that looks, we're saying take the events collection and remove everything that's in there. So remove everything that is in there. And then we'll say update with the new events that we have we have observed. Uh, be very careful at the notation. Remember the underscore events that you see in purple, that's the one that I declared up above that is the private attribute of this class where no underscore events is simply what we're observing on from our view model and notice that that's what we're calling this lambda incoming variable, if that makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, just pay very close attention to where I've put an underscore and where I've not put an underscore. If you happen to switch those around, it can get very confusing. One more thing we need to do, and believe it or not, that's it. Tell the recycler view to update. And we say RCY, events for specimens, uh, dot adapter, Assert that it's not null, and then say notify dataset changed, which just says, okay, tell it it's updated. 
Now there is a chance that that adapter might be null if the line down below has not fired yet. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and put this observe down beneath that. Even then, it's probably a good idea to put a null check around that, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to do that right at this moment. There we go. So now at least it makes a bit more logical sense on how it's lined up. Now I've pre-populated a few items here. Take a look at the Austrian pine sapling down 39.14. You see I have a couple of items in the recycler view, a few events that I added when I paused the video. Let's change this to something else. Let's go to the purple saxifrage, and you see we don't have any items. Let's go to the feather reed grass under the purple saxifrage, and you see now I have a couple of events along with photos for those events. So you see, as I pick each specimen, the recycler view updates with the events for that specimen because when I pick the specimen for the spinner, it kicks off that update events function that we created on our model view view model. That goes out and tells Firebase, hey, give me the collection that belongs to the specimen. And then we're listening to that collection and then we update the mutable live data with that collection and that kicks off our recycler view to update as well. So let's try one out ourselves. Let's go back to the purple saxifrage. And you see nothing here, okay. We'll go ahead and go to the event screen and let's give it a few things. We'll say water, quantity one, let's say quantity two gallons, event date 03-15-2020, and let's say it was dry, just like so, and then we'll choose save. Won't worry about a picture for this, we'll just keep it simple. And now let's say fertilize. Quantity, we'll say three cups, event date 03202020, high potassium fertilizer. And once again, save. So you notice that the recycler view that's local to this screen is updating, but we know that was from a previous video, simply updating from memory. Let's go back to the specimen screen. In the specimen screen, it defaults to that very first item. Let's go ahead and go to our purple saxifrage. Now take a look at this. Do you see fertilized 3.0 cups high potassium fertilizer and water 2.0 gallons, it was dry. Remember, we're back on our specimen fragment, not the event fragment, that's number one. Number two, you see that this updated pretty much live from Firebase. Let me show you something even more cool. Let's walk this path in our Firebase database. So we start with specimens. And I made a note, 1XOETX, take a look at what this is, purple saxifrage, a nice purple plant. Now note that we have this collection of events, which is the one that you and I just created together live. If I click on events, notice it takes us out to these two events. One is high potassium fertilizer, and the other event is it was dry two gallons of water. Now I'm gonna try and do a little split screen here so we can see both at once. And I realize it's kind of a, a hard font to see, but take a look at two gallons of water. Why don't I update this to four and watch, watch the Android emulator here on the right. Four gallons of water. You see that screen updated automatically. Let's go to our other item and I had high potassium fertilizer. Let's change this one just a bit. We'll say high potassium and phosphorus fertilizer and I choose update. As soon as I choose update, look over here and you notice it updates there. That is really exciting. So not only are we updating when, we're, when we are changing things within our app, but we're also updating the UI automatically when changes happen outside of our app. The reason I find this very exciting is think of the potential. You think about stock trading, real-time flight information, all that kind of stuff. I remember back when I was an undergrad in the mid 90s, just thinking it about, wow, wouldn't it be cool if we had a user interface that could update automatically based on data updating somewhere else? And if you roll back to the mid 90s, that thought at the time was nearly impossible. You usually had to wait overnight for something to update. Real-time update of a UI based on an external event is just amazing. So of course, as always, I hope this video was helpful and I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.